oh man, what are you, what, what are you, different foursome every, every day? And, you know, guys probably kneeling at whole night, yeah, Jesus, come into my life, thank you, you know. What, what we have so bought into, people are thinking, I'm not coming back. He's slamming TV now. He's slamming golf. Hey, I'll play nine with you later. I love to play golf. But do you, but do you understand the mentality of what we're doing? We, we think the goal is that to get so far, stop, and then coast. The reality and the joy of life is not in the attainment. It is in the process. And so many people in their mid-50s, 60s, and 70s, you never, ever will have more to give to God, to the kingdom, to people, to your grandchildren, to your neighbors, or your church than you do right now. And we got people going, well, you know, hey, you know, I, I did my time. Your time's done when you're done. You know, I don't have first retirement 1-7. Now, you may... You may you may physically retire, you may rearrange your schedule, but you know something? You're done when you're done. You know, well, Moses, what if Moses at 79 said, you know, I'm going to be 80 next year, I think I'll bag it. <laughs> We'd be in trouble. Finally, think great thoughts about challenges. How we think about the difficulties and the adversities that come into my, our life really shape us. James says some very hard words, but they're said to a group of people that are in a lot worse shape than most of us. First book written in the New Testament. It says to verse 1 of James chapter 1, it's to those scattered abroad. It's, they're Jewish Christians, and they've come to know Christ, and a lot of people are becoming kind of human torches, and persecution has hit. And some people said, you know, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. And their parents said, guess what? Um, you're no longer my son, you're no longer my daughter, and now you don't have an inheritance, you don't have a place to live, and the persecution came, and they're spread out, and they've lost home, they've lost relationships, they've lost their jobs, they've lost their companies, everything, they have a broken world. It is not working. It's shattered. Their financial security, their relational security, everything that helps us stay sort of solid is gone. So what would God say to a group of people like that? Consider it. It, it, the word is reckon, think thoughtfully, ponder, consider it pure or all joy. What? When you encounter various kinds of trials. The word for various trials there has the idea of those things that come from the outside, those circumstances, those uncontrollable things. Consider it, choose, literally, choose to consider it joy when adversity and difficulty comes into your life. And you're thinking, why? Knowing and the word for knowing here, circle it if you would. It's not an intellectual knowledge. There's two words in the New Testament for knowing. One has to do with knowing by way of experience. The other is an intellectual, you know, two plus two is four. I know that's true. This is knowing by way of experience. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let or allow endurance to have its perfect result, that you may be perfect or mature. I like the version you have right there. Perfect or mature and complete, lacking in nothing. James would say to a group of people who, guess what? In, in our vernacular, their marriage broke up. They had a grandchild commit suicide. They financially thought everything would be okay, but now, wow, some things really went in a way that, and you're in a situation where you're thinking, I never dreamed I'd be where I am now. I ran into two people in the last week who've been married over 30 years whose mate walked out on them. Broken world experience. How do you respond to that? How do you respond to the inner struggles and the pressures and the sick of being loneliness and wanting a mate and crying out to God and it's not there? Or a problem in a marriage that, you know, God, 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 I know divorce isn't right, I know divorce isn't right, I know that's an option, but man, this stinks. This stinks. Help, help, help. Or working on a business or working on an issue and no matter what happens, it just won't come together. What do you do? You choose to think about it biblically. What we tend to do is say, well, you know what? I'm like this because what my mom and dad did. Or actually, it's not couldn't be my dad because he left this when I was two. Or I'm like this because, you know, that, you know, that guy was my boss. I'll tell you what. When they did that, I'll tell you, that guy is such a jerk. And we have people who live with a blame, shame, or victim mentality, and it's everybody else's fault. And you know how you think great thoughts about your adversity, your challenge? I choose because God is in control. I choose to consider this pure or unmitigated joy. A feeling? No, it's a choice. 
Why? Because what I know is that God, being all-knowing, good, wise, and powerful, what I know for sure is this adversity is going to do something, and this testing is going to produce endurance. Like a weightlifter, you, you put the weights on, and you start doing the dips. And like a weightlifter, if you keep doing that, guess what's going to happen? Over time, those muscle fibers begin to split. Any of you guys that have listed weights? And that's why you rest the second day, then it heals. And how's it heal? Stronger. God brings weights into your life sovereignly, lovingly, wisely. Internal weights, relational weights, financial weights, family weights. Painful things into your life. It's a fallen world. He allows them to happen, but he's going to work them for good. But your response, how you think about it, your attitude, will make all the difference. You can either be a victim, whine, complain, substitute, soothe and medicate your pain with unhealthy things. Or you can say, I'm going to make a choice. I choose to consider this all joy because God is going to produce endurance and endurance does something to a man or a woman. It does something to their character. I'm going to let God use this to make me more and more like his son so that I am perfect, mature, teleos, so I can fulfill the design that God ultimately wants in me. I'm going to become more and more like Jesus through this suffering. Hebrews 5, although he was a son, speaking of Jesus, although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And we're living in an evangelical community who does everything to avoid suffering rather than saying it is a part of what happens in a fallen world. And people will see more of Jesus in your life by how you go through suffering, whether it's internal, family, financial, health. They'll see more of Christ in your life by how you go through suffering than your great successes in saying Jesus did it all. We've got to think accurately great thoughts about God, ourselves, our future, our past, our challenges. Because you're a product of your thought life. How do you get there? Let me give you a little to-go package and we'll wind it up. Has anyone got the idea that possibly memorizing and med meditating on Scripture is going to be a part of this deal? And you know what? You don't have to kill yourself on this. You can write them on three by five cards. Uh, I think the NAS still put out the topical memory system. I started with just 60 verses. And you know, they have, you know, 30 topics. You memorize two verses. And then I just started making up topics of my own. And then you just, you know, you, and then you do have to review them for four or five weeks so they won't stick. And then you'll get so many that it'll get a little overwhelming. And some of you get a little arrogant. You get a few hundred verses and you'll think, oh, wow. And then God will bring some humbling things into your life. And you'll realize it's not memorizing the verses. I'm sorry, Lord. And, you know, it's knowledge puffs up, love edifies. But then you'll just develop a little system. And as, you, as God really speaks to you, you write it down and you memorize it and you use those little times where you're kind of bored and you will find that God will renew your mind and transform your life. I encourage you to use your drive time. I, don't, you know, I, I listen to teaching tapes. Uh, I, I do listen to worship. But sometimes just turn it all off. Be quiet. Think great thoughts. You know, what, what if you just take, took these seven areas? What if you took these seven areas that I gave you and the single verse that I gave you and you wrote, think great thoughts about God, Romans eleven thirty three, 33, and you wrote it down and you made seven cards and in the next couple weeks, you just started in on them and just read them over and begin to think and then add kind of little, little thoughts of your own on the back of the card about thinking great thoughts. You know what happened? I, I'm just telling you, in, in 10 days, you, your emotions will start to shift. Why? Because right thinking produces to what? Positive emotions, which leads to wise behavior, which leads to fruitful consequences. Second, or third actually, is listen to great music. Uh, thinking great thoughts. I, it's interesting. I'm reading through uh, The Daily Walk. I, I, I did it for years and years and years, and then I haven't done it. And Teresa and I thought, you know, let's, let's kind of go back and read through The Daily Walk Bible. And so we're, we thought, well, you know, we're, now we're grandparents, so we're thinking like grandparents. So we got, we got a daily walk Bible for all of our kids and all their wives and everybody. And so I don't know if they're all doing it, but at least theoretically we can be moving through the Bible together. And it just feels warm and ooey-gooey in this grandfather's heart, you know, just right here, you know. And uh, so it's interesting, though, that I'm reading through Moses after all the turmoil. And when he wanted the people, the second generation after they blew it, did you notice what happened, what God told him to do? God said, Moses, you know, round one, they didn't do so well. There's a very loose translation of that phrase. 
But, uh, you know, we need to do better this time. So what I want you to do is I, I want you, after you review it, put it into a song. And we have the Song of Moses. And in and, and my Bible, you know, it's pretty small print, but I mean, it's three or four columns. He put the entire history of Israel and the greatness of God and redemption and deliverance and who God is and who we are and what he did and what his promises are, and he put it in a song. I don't think there's anything probably that is an easier way to memorize or to also get good things in your mind by listen to great music. And finally, uh, take those walks in nature and... Um, and hear God's voice. One of the things that I've done that's been very helpful, I learned this from my wife, was memorizing random scriptures can be very helpful. But um, I've tried to look inside my heart and my life and my family, and I, I realize I've got, I've got a half a dozen issues, you know. Maybe I've got 12, but I've only learned about six or seven so far. And, and they're reoccurring. I, I get overextended. Why? Well, I... Down deep, I want to prove myself. I don't believe God really loves me. Okay. Well, you know, you can just keep being a workaholic or you can keep pleasing people and you can just have a quiet time over here and not make the connection. And so what I finally did years ago, I said, you know something? This is the truth I need. And so I wrote down, I feel compelled to please people, to be on the go, to make this happen because I down deep don't believe I'm significant in your eyes. Period. Stop. And then turn the card over. And then put a Zephaniah 317 on the other end. And just take, what are the issues in your life? Is it, you know, temptation with lust? Memorize a verse on that. Is it struggles in a relationship? Is it uh, temptation with the media? But take the area where you struggle, and we all do, and, and write out your bad thinking, and then write stop. In fact, I even made a little stop sign. Mine's very artistic. And then flip it over and put the truth. And what you can train your mind to do, you can train your mind because you read the, that one, you say, stop. When unconsciously those thoughts come because you've been programmed, the stop will come and then God will bring the verse to mind and you can break out of destructive habits. Your life can totally change. Does it take time? Yeah. Does it take work? Yes. Take focus? Absolutely. Take discipline? Mm-hmm. Those are like di fruits of the Spirit, you know? Think great thoughts and you will experience a great God and a great life. I want to thank you for joining us today. And as we close today's program, I gave you some very specific ways to learn to think great thoughts. And what I have to tell you is there is no little shortcut. There is no magic bullet. Uh, there's not a pill that you can take that will cause you to think great thoughts. It requires energy and discipline and a plan and a lot of effort. But here's what I want you to know. I meet people after 25 years as a pastor that, you know, they long to get into the Bible. They long to be a better parent. Uh, they long to maybe lose some weight and get in shape. Uh, they long to deal with an anger issue. And they focus on either their feelings or their behavior, and they try and try and try and try, and they do not see sustained, lasting change. Here's what I want to tell you. Great Christians change their thinking first. And so that little list I gave you, it won't be easy, but identify the one area where you know God wants you to change. Go to the scripture and say, what's a passage, what's a promise, like I shared. I gave you four or five or six of them, and you can go to the website and download those if you want them. But go to the website and say, God, what area is it my thinking about you, about myself, about others? Write that on a verse and write down how you think negatively and then on the back of that, write the verse, begin to read that over. For others, it's taking walks in a park, it's seeing nature. You will be the product of your thought life. Great Christians think great thoughts. Are you willing to take that challenge? Are you willing to say, I'm gonna discipline, I'm gonna take the time, the energy, and the effort to begin to change what goes in my mind and what I think about? In this next broadcast, we're going to learn the role of reading great books and putting new things into your mind that will start this process in ways like you never dreamed. I hope you join me.